This is going to be episode four. I'm going to run out of fingers eventually, which will be cool because I love having these conversations. But episode four of the Conversations with Coaches series, I get to sit down with a lot of different coaches and different aspects. One of the things I'm looking forward to doing is having coaches from other fields as well, be it like physical therapists who do remote coaching, sports performance coaching, mental health coaching, nutrition coaching. I want to bring them all on here. So it's going to be an interesting conversation because you can learn a lot from other fields, not just people who are predominantly in the strength field and whatnot. So there's a lot to offer. We're just waiting for Jake Hartman to hop on here and send the join request. As soon as Jake hops on here, it takes like three to five seconds for it to come through. We'll have dual screen. He just joined. So he should send a join request pretty soon. And we'll get to talk about his history in his sport, him and I as competitors together, him and I as friends, uh, his gym, DSM Barbell Club in Des Moines, Des Moines, did I say that right? Iowa. <laughs> it's in Iowa. That's all that matters, right? Coaches remotely, and there's a lot of things that Jake can offer us as far as systems, because having a big corporate background in different worlds is going to be able to provide us with more things from systems. All right. We go. I got this right. What's happening, Jake? Hey, what's going on, man? How are you? Good. How's the weather up there? Uh, it's actually really nice now. It's spring, so it's spring. Uh, hey, like here's 60. like 40 degrees. <laughs> yeah, no. There for a while, it was like super cold and then nice, and then now it's nice, and then in a couple weeks it'll be 90. So, so, uh, so, so that's kind of how the that in spring, 40 degrees is. Nice. Yeah. I don't want to have the heart and with like 82 outside right now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I like that like 40 to 60 degree weather. Yeah, it's going to get too hot too fast. And, you know, with the, with the gym with no air conditioning, uh, it's going to be interesting as always. So. Yeah, it's fun. Well, you have big fans in there. I've been in there. It's a really cool gym. Uh, I know you have a turf in the center. You have like monoliths, combo racks, specialty bars, dumbbells, a great cable unit, if I remember correctly. Yep. A lot of different um, bodybuilding accessory machines were there. An awesome space. Yeah, we added uh, a lot of machine stuff since you've been there, too. So we've just kind of expanded in the bodybuilding uh, section. And then uh, moving to the WRPF, we've picked up a couple more monoliths. Uh, now all of our, I mean, we can still host combo meets, but <clears throat> now all those combo racks I have won't be seeing as much use. So Yeah, you get the option of WRPF, which is pretty cool. You can run either a combo or a monolith. And let's yeah. be real, anyone wraps and even lazy people like me who don't really like to walk out because I can't feel my left leg. I love a, I love a monolith. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been interesting transitioning and all that stuff. I mean, obviously everybody wants a monolith to meet uh, with the opportunity to do that. So um, with the opportunity to walk out. So it, it makes, uh, it makes the meets more competitive, I think uh, all around and makes the Federation competitive with, with, uh, with everybody else too. So. I agree. When did you start in this sport? I know uh, you've been in this sport over 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, or just about 10 years. Yeah, so I started training specifically for powerlifting in 2012. Uh, I think my first meet was, my first sanctioned meet was in 2013. I think I did an unsanctioned meet in 2012. Um, so yeah, on 10 years now, um, which is crazy. It seems like just yesterday. <laughs> So I love to throw this fact around that 50% of the people who are active in the sport now won't be active after five years, and yeah. you're still in actively for 10, not just actively in it, thriving in it as competitor, coach, gym owner, apparel, uh, meat director, uh, supplement line. What am I missing? Uh, I think that pretty much covers it now. And uh, more recently, I've gone full-time uh, doing uh, coaching at the gym. So there for the longest time, I was still working that day job. And uh, last last month in the middle of March, uh, I got laid off. So, uh, which was, uh, I mean, really natural segue, obviously. Like I spent a lot of time at the gym anyways, and it was kind of my fallback plan the entire time. Um, so now I'm able to like, you know, fully invest myself uh, into training and into the gym and, and, and see it grow. So um, I'm excited about that. When did you transition from athlete to coach? Uh, really, it was shortly after uh, I started uh, competing because back in that time, I mean, you remember there was there was nothing as far as customized stuff goes. So, you know, we had people running like five three one. I had people in the gym running Shaco. I had people running uh, the Cube Method. It just come out, uh, you know, shortly after that. Um, but none of it was customized. So these guys were getting these you know cookie cutter programs, and some of them were good programs. Um, but they wanted to have small tweaks on those programs and didn't really have the, uh, the knowledge as to how and why. 
Um, so a lot of people just naturally gravitated towards me. I mean, before I was a power lifter, I was, you know, I started lifting when I was 15. So, you know, I've been already actively lifting and uh, in strength sports for probably 10 years before that even. So, um, you know, I had, a, I knew my way around the gym. And so, you know, people naturally just sort of came to me and asked me like what I thought about each movement and why they should do things. And after a while, I was like, all right, I'll, you know, I'll take on a couple people and I'll write some customized stuff. And you know how that's kind of how it goes with everybody, right? Like you write some stuff for your buddy, they start to see some progress. You're like, all right, that's cool. Maybe this is a thing. And then you just, you know, continually learn and grow it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it started. People just keep asking you to help them. And then eventually you're like, my time, I have to charge you. And then it keeps growing from there. Uh, you brought up interesting point that you know when we first were not first when we were in the, the sport there wasn't a lot of information there wasn't a lot of programs available there was cookie cutter routines the original 531 was not actually a powerlifting program it was a conditioning program for for um i'm drawing a blank right now for this uh wendler he was like a 308 multiply lifter just felt incredibly awful and out of shape and he wanted to lose weight as fast as possible and get athletic so it was jumps and sled first pushes and linear work with volume for rep maxes work for volume. It had nothing to do with powerlifting. It's why he came out with a book like three years later, five, three, one, four powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And so people didn't know how to customize and tweak those programs, which led to a lot of burnout or injuries or misuse. Even now I get people who reach out to me and they're following some program from some famous lifter that's like, it was designed to fit that outlier and it just mm -hmm. the ground. So the ability to customize is something people don't understand with coaching and programming you're trying to get individual to what their needs are, whether it's exercise selection, volume of pre uh, allocation, um, rest recovery, how often they have to deload, because you've been in this long enough to know, not everyone's gonna be able to go six weeks without deload. And there's programs out there that are 13 weeks without a deload. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I was, now I, he's following a program for like eight weeks so far, and finally I'm like, dude, enough. You know, um, he just wanted to hire me to do like form corrections and stuff like that. He's like, all right, you write it. And he's, he's, every week I feel better and better and better, like eight weeks without a deload. And he was doing four and five exercises after the main lifts that were five times 20 reps each. <laughs> but it has a very famous name behind it. I'm like, I'm not going to knock that. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about that, right? If you're working with a lifter now and you've lasted more than 10 years as a competitor and obviously you've grown to this great aspect, what's your number one uh, tip? for longevity for the new lifter coming up? Um, just listen to your body. I mean, it, it sounds, uh, you know, cheesy, but like there are so many times where I trade, train through little nagging injuries because I have a meet that I have to train for. Uh, it just it makes the issues way worse. You know, you end up training through this injury, you make the injury worse. Um, you never fully recover from it. I mean, you know, when I used to work with you, I had a lingering issue that, you know, I'd had for five plus years. Um, and that was through me being stubborn and, and trying to train through an injury. So listening to your body, learning your body, knowing when to deload, uh, you know, what type of volume to do, how, how often you should be going heavy. Uh, and, and just putting blinders on and not, not looking at other people in the gym. Uh, that's another one too, because that's where the ego lifting comes in. Um, you know, and, and just knowing what your end goal is sticking to that plan and, and just being very aware of, of yourself. I would say that's probably the most underrated aspect of knowing when to take a step back or when to shut down a little bit, because we're going to, Greg Panora and I talked about this on so many different seminars. Like, if you took a step back or shut it down in the West Side, you were kicked out. Like, mm -hmm. there are a lot. And he talked about this. Like, the average person there, you know, the new person coming in lasted, like, eight months. He's like, but the lifers, a lifer at West Side was, like, 14 months. <laughs> of a life at West Side. So, two outliers who made it several years, but they're beaten down and broken up because they never took that step back. And it's like, if yeah. you love it and you want to do it as long as you can, listen to your body. You know, you, you know your gut instinct's telling you, slow down. You don't have to do, you know, there's other meets or other opportunities or one day of holding back because you feel funny just to see where it's at. doesn't throw off your whole program. Yeah. That's the other thing too. You know, uh, people think that missing one workout and obviously in the beginning, yeah, it's super important for you to get in your sessions, right? You're, you're learning, you're growing. Uh, you have a lot of opportunity for growth in that time. But once you become a novice to advance, like you, you can take months off at a time 
and come back into the sport in a month, a month and a half, and, and pick up where you left off at. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of lifters don't understand. It's, you know, like, for example, me having kids. Uh, you know, I was chasing that 1,800 pound total for the longest time. I hit like 1796, like 1781, like literally <laughs> five different totals that were like 10 pounds short of, of the goal. Um, and I took, you know, some substantial time off after having kids and having injuries. And, uh, you know, I came back in, in a training block that, you know, just went really well because my body felt great because I, I, you know, took the time off to take care of myself and uh, listen to my body, made sure I was doing, you know, proper deloads, making sure I was timing my sessions right. Um, and hit that 1802, 1803 uh, total, you know, finally. And it was, the funny part about it was, it was, it wasn't hard. You know, like I probably had more in the tank and it was, <laughs> it was funny the timing because there were so many times where I'm like, oh, I got this in the bag, right? And then this meeting that came in and I was like, eh, we'll see what happens. We'll have some, we'll have some fun. And I ended up squatting like 30 more pounds than I expected to squat. And I, you know, I literally had fun just because I'd been off the platform for a while. My body felt good. Uh, and that's really all that it took. So um, that's, you know, especially for the intermediate advanced lifters, uh, you know, like be, being smart is, uh, there's something to be said about it. We saw all that after COVID, you know, when everyone was out of gyms for months mm -hmm. and people picked up in six eight weeks and they were like they never left it's just because the strength is primarily neurological efficiency so once you regain the neurological efficiency it was really easy to put everything else together so yeah. that's a great is to you know if you have a bad day or you have to have an injury you're still working on something you're just not putting yourself under the barbell and uh, i recently posted about that with andy because he took you know andy wong took, mm -hmm. took he took uh, uh like seven months off of a straight bar off of his back because he didn't want to have bad shoulders and bad hips and knees and he's like let me just bodybuild around this keep building muscle and he's like back to where he was. Now he's prepping for the American Pro. Yep. It's not. It's not hard to not, not beat yourself up in this sport if you let go of the ego and don't have to low bar squat every single week. Right, and I, I think another aspect of it that a lot of people don't talk about is just mental burnout. Yeah, uh, you know, like that's something that I mean, the sport is three lifts and accessory lifts based around those three lifts. Uh, you know, we can we can do all sorts of fun and exciting. Uh, variations and, and make it as complicated as we want. But at the end of the day, it's, it is not the most exciting sport. Uh, you know, add in, add in some nagging pain uh, or chronic injuries in general, you're not having very much fun. Um, so I think that taking that time off to uh, give yourself a mental break, give your body a break. And I mean, when I came back into that meet, I was super motivated, right? Like I was having fun. Uh, and that was, for me, that was a big part of it because there for a while, like when we did that meet down in Florida, like it was fun to compete with you, but it was not fun to train for that. <laughs> and doing the meet itself is not very fun. Uh, I, literally, I literally don't want to do meets with my friends now. Like if I can't find something there I can lift and compete with, I don't even want to go. Right. No, the, the motivating factor for me doing that meet because, you know, I just had kids and my sleep was shit. I had that, you know, some chronic injuries, but my, my motivation for doing that meet was doing a meet with you guys. And uh, uh, I, if that wouldn't have been there, I, I would have not done the meet. Um, and, you know, I was somebody that back in the day, like, if I sign up for a meet, I'm doing that meet or I'm going to die. Like, that's, that's how it is. Yeah, and, Boston adductor that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and nowadays, I'm like, eh, if it doesn't feel right, like, I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to push it. So um knowing knowing when to push it knowing you know giving yourself those mental and physical breaks um you know that's given me some success mm -hmm. in of ways so all right i wanted to ask you an interesting question because this is a question i've gotten over so many years and you and i have both had various sponsorships throughout our years as a lifter which people don't really understand is, is i don't want to say it's overrated it's great that you have but mm -hmm. it's it's one of those things like how do i get sponsored so i know it's a relatively simple lean question but that's a question that people often ask for someone like you or me like you were sponsored by american barbell club for the longest time i think you're with strong house now um i have iron rebel and death for dishonor who reached out to me for sponsorship how did those relationships come about um so with john at american barbell club i mean we had a lot of mutual friends through the hardcore scene and i mean taking one step back before we even get to that like for sponsorships 
I, you know, I'll only work with people that I'm actually friends with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't care if you have a great product. I don't care if you're going to pay me money to, you know, use your product or, or, or market for your product. If you're, if I'm not cool with you, you're not my friend, then I'm not going to, you know, I'm not about it. So um, that was a big part of it too, because, you know, I've, I've, I've heard of all the horror stories of people having these sponsorships where it's, it's very one-sided, you know, the company expects a lot. You have to post a certain amount of social media posts. You got to do a certain amount of things, post your code as many times. And I'm just like, I'm not going to do that. Like it's, it's not natural. It's not organic. Like people see through it, like just, there's no point. So anyways, with John, uh, we had a lot of mutual friends through the hardcore scene. So, you know, it was, it was, uh, uh, easy to talk to him. We had, you know, obviously music in common. Um, and you know, we, we really hit it off. So with that, it was just, uh, we, I bought so much stuff from John. Uh, eventually one day he was just like, Hey, do you want to be an athlete? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, cool. All right. Like I, I, I never like was seeking out sponsorships. Um, I, and I never really like considered myself good enough for a sponsorship, I guess. Like, I didn't, I didn't really process it, right? Like I'm somebody that like, if I want a product, I'm fine paying for it. Um, if I like your product, I want to support your company. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that was it. And that's how I got in with, with, with John was just supporting his company. And he was like, all right, this is a cool dude. He's, you know, he sees me for what I am, uh, you know, being genuine and, and telling him all the things that I just said. Um, and yeah, it was, that was a cool, a cool relationship. Um, I'm not sponsored by Stronghouse Project, just for the record. Um, I love oh, those guys. I love those guys. Uh, I, I, you know, support them 100%. I buy their products all the time, but that's something that I've never really had a conversation with them about. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, Eric and those guys over there are good people. So you, you brought up a point of you supported the brand first, mm -hmm. and then you relationship with the people who manage or own it and run it and it, john was actually technically my first sponsor uh he walked to europa one time because i've been doing like every meet and he just hands me like a bag full of t-shirts and check for 100 bucks and I'm just, a bunch of like traps. he's like you do a lot for florida power thing here <laughs> yeah. i was like cool <laughs> so yeah i've never asked um same i've just established friendships and like i'm friends with andy huang you know a few days you guys one of the owners of iron rebel uh mm -hmm. friend Jared and uh, Depth Report is honor. Obviously, I'm wearing a shirt, but the tattoo culture kind of just brings a lot of people together because we're weird and different and people enjoy it. Yeah. But been establishing relationships with people and supporting the brand first and then getting to a point where they want to support you back because you support them. It's not one of those things you just tag every single company in your post and hope that they know, notice you. <laughs> it's, I, yeah. Nothing, I think too. nothing drives me crazy more than people asking for sponsorships, A, or B, people talking about how good they are. Um, those <laughs> two things, I can promise you, will not get you a sponsorship. Uh, those are the two things that you don't want to do if you want to have a legitimate sponsorship. I used to go to a lifter who tagged like 10 different companies. None of them were his sponsors. And I'm like, they're all competing companies. I'm like, this is not helping you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting yeah. tactic as well. I, have, I haven't really seen that, but um, yeah, that's funny. It's interesting. All right, let's talk about your coaching. Uh, you have athletes that are both in person, I believe, within the gym. Yep, yeah. And so just started picking up more in-person in clients. Uh, before I was working my day job, so I was fully swamped in the middle of the day, like when people would want to train, obviously. Um, so I was working only remotely with online clients. Um, and yeah, that's that's the business where, like, uh, for the longest time, uh, you know, I, I actively focused on growing it. Uh, always took on new clients and all that. And then after a while with my day job, getting to the point where we we're super busy, me having kids, all that sort of stuff, I kind of backed off on, you know, actively building the roster, if you will. Uh, so now that I'm going full time with it again, you know, I'm back to, to picking up more online clients, picking up more in-person clients. Uh, and it's fun. It's great. Like I have all this free time to, to talk to my people and uh, like fully invest myself into it. So it's been, it's been a, a big change. Yeah, that's the, that's the greatest aspect of coaching is getting to build those relationships and network and talk to those people and work them through these problems. What is the biggest challenge you have with your coaching aspect now with the in-person versus the remote? Uh, so I think it's probably like just a pretty standard stuff. 
um, you know, remote. It's just going to matter like, hey, how experienced is the person that you're working with? Um, you know, obviously, if you have somebody that's starting from scratch, that literally is, you know, squatted maybe a couple times in their life, it's going to be really challenging to make the adjustments uh, that they need on their technique without being hands on, right? Like, you can, you can do a, a video technique review of their squat, but, you know, unless you're there to, to, to physically talk them through it and work them through it, you can say any, any squatting cue you want, and they're just, you know, it's just going to go over their head. Um, so that's definitely the hardest part of, of online uh, coaching in general is, is finding, uh, sometimes finding the words to explain it, even to more advanced lifters as well, um, you know, or intermediate lifters who have been lifting for a while, and you tell them a couple different uh, you know, cues or uh, ways to explain something that you want them to do. And then eventually one of them clicks. Um, but that's definitely a, 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 you know, a barrier. Uh, and really the only true downfall, I think, of, of most online programming, if you're working with somebody that's, that's uh, experienced and good at it. Um, and then, it's, I mean, in, in person, it's, you know, it's interesting because, like, I got a couple new guys right now that are starting just from scratch. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a good new challenge for me because for the longest time, most of my online clients were lifters who had been lifting for a while, you know, like I, not to say I wouldn't take on brand new people, but most of my people were just people that had been lifting and powerlifting, um, you know, obviously hit a plateau, stalled out in their progress and they're like, all right, it's time to take it to the next level. What can I do? So, um, working with people that are, are literally brand new, um, who have maybe stepped foot in a gym just a couple times, um, but have that motivation and drive, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a different, uh, mindset for me to take it all the way, all the way back to the basics, um, which is a, a, a fun and unique challenge for me at this point. The best way to learn a lift is to teach it. I love that, you know, because like Wong has the same thing in his gym. They're almost all entirely, not now, but almost entirely when we started, they're all entirely novices. And they were just doing like boot camp stuff mm -hmm. with like balls and eight pound dumbbells. And now they have a barbell on their back and you're having to teach the absolute fundamentals and basics. People ask me all the time, like, where are these cues and weird things that I say come from? It's like, because I worked with Gen Pop for a long time. Yeah. They don't understand these. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little different. Now, I know you offer, or you used to, I don't know if you still do. So do you still offer nutrition coaching alongside of your powerlifting coaching? Yeah, so that's something else I'm planning on picking up. Uh, there for the longest time, I didn't do much on the nutrition side, uh, just because with powerlifters, there wasn't a lot of demand for it. Um, now, obviously, I would I would give my powerlifters guidelines to follow as far as like, hey, take in this much protein. Hey, eat this many carbs. Like I would give them general macros and, and, and meal ideas and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, they'd give me feedback about what they're eating and I would make so, small tweaks to it. But it was not like formalized uh, you know, macro programming or meal planning or anything like that. Um, so now that I'm doing this more full time and getting more general population people, obviously I have more people that want to lose weight. Um, you know, some of these newer guys want to gain weight. Um, so, and then they just don't have any idea where to start. Yeah. Um, or like the specific programming of a meal plan of eat this, eat this, eat this, because the, the rigidness of it was so hard for someone to follow. Mm -hmm. And so but I really loved that, giving the macro guidelines, the calorie guidelines, and teaching someone, you know, the autonomy to be able to create and fit within those macros the foods they like to eat yeah. throughout the day. And that's so much easier and it's a much bigger rock to move them forward than to be like, hey, you have to eat four ounces of this with goji berries and whatever. It's like, you're like, what? <laughs> what <you> yeah, <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. Uh, one thing I have seen, though, with some of these newer people, like writing out uh, a more rigid plan to show them just so it like registers in their brain, right? Because like, they don't even really know like how much of what to eat per meal. Uh, so I don't think that they're necessarily going to follow with a high success rate, but uh, at least having a baseline of knowing what they're looking at um, and then giving them options to, to fill in those blanks, uh, like you're saying is, is definitely, um, you know, allows them to customize it and has a higher success rate. You still use True Coach as your platform? I still use true coach yep uh, i've been on with true coach now for about a million years i gotta go back and see when i started with true coach because i swear i probably started with true coach right up within the first name. year or i don't remember what it was but they changed the name to true coach yeah i don't remember what it was before either but like i 
I was probably within the first year or so of True Coach uh, being created uh, on that platform. You've set up some unique systems within your gym. You have a gym manager, uh, and I think you have instructors or groups within the gym, correct, right? I know one of them's on the call here, CEO of Fitness, Odell or something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, right now I actually have uh, – we've, we've sort of shifted what we want to do with the gym. Um, and uh, instead of having independent contractors as far as trainers at the gym, uh, I switched that over to everybody being actual physical staff of the gym. Nice. Um, and the main reason for that was because we just – didn't have structure, right? Like everybody was doing their own thing. Uh, for some people, you know, is it was working really well. For other people, not so much. Obviously, when you have a new trainer coming into an environment like that, it doesn't really benefit them uh, because everybody's kind of dog eat dog. Uh, they have their different different approach and all that. Um, the pricing was way different on everybody's stuff, so it was just kind of all over the board. And you know, I was like, we need to sit down and come up with a collaborative uh, effort here so that we're all helping each other out. So we're all making sure our schedules are full. Um, and it's, it's been insane over the last year how much the personal training business has grown because of that. Um, and, and Carly on the, on the call here is, uh, she's one of our you know, top producers as far as training goes because she absolutely loves it. She's super passionate about it. Um, and I love being surrounded by people like that, you know, like uh, before in some of the gym environments I worked at, like n people did not enjoy working there. Um, so it's really refreshing to be able to go to work every day, work with people I like, work with uh, like-minded people as well. Um, and then as far as outside of just the training staff, uh, we do have a physical therapist uh, in the gym, uh, Logan oh. at the gym. And then we have uh, Miranda does body tempering as well. So we got, you know, a little bit of everything there, uh, aside from, you know, massage, uh, but I mean, you got the body tempering and the physical to help you out with that. So 117 pounds, maybe. It doesn't look like much. And last time I was in Iowa, she did body tempering on me. I was like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going to lean on this a little bit. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's interesting. Iowa is a pretty big area for body tempering. Um, we have some, some really good uh, practitioners here. Um, and obviously Miranda being one of them, uh, taking all the courses and making sure that she's up to date with all the most recent techniques. Um, yeah, uh, she's definitely worked on me and I've been very close to tapping before. Uh, and now, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. in Cairo, I think is her Instagram handle, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So if you're in Iowa and you need body tempering, you probably want it. It's, it's wonderful. It sounds painful, but it's not that bad, but it's wonderful. So, <laughs> so, so make sure you're at like an eight, eight not a nine yeah. out of intensity. If she knows you, she'll just take it out on you. But if she doesn't, <laughs> she'll be. She doesn't. Now, how are you managing all that with your own training? Because that's something that a lot of people who have mm -hmm. been in contact with their own gyms or train clients and train people within gym, they're struggling with their boundaries as far as their own training. How are you managing your training within that environment? Um, so oh, there for the longest time, I was training at nine o'clock at night. <laughs> so we're not. No. <laughs> Which is funny because then at, at night, like literally nine o'clock at night would be the busiest time in the gym. Um, so that kind of backfired on me eventually. Um, it's, it's hard, you know, like people are always going to ask me questions. Um, there are definitely times where I've had to tell people like, Hey, I'm training right now. You know, I'll, you can, you know, ask me when I'm done or, you know, send me an email or shoot me a text and I'll respond when I'm done. Um, I don't like doing that. Like, if you know me, I, I will literally stop in the middle of what I'm doing to help somebody. Uh, so that is definitely an issue. Um, but with the flexibility now of training people, I can train in the middle of the day, which in the gym, it's, uh, it's busy all the time at this point, but it's definitely a little bit slower on those times. Um, so I can hit those uh, midday sessions, and then I still hit a couple of evening sessions, um, you know, here and there to fit it in, and then on the weekends in the middle of the day, too. So usually I'm just training at times uh, when, you know, it's not as busy, and if I have to put boundaries in place, like, there's always that certain that certain person. Um, and if, it, if the gym is busy and things are going on, sometimes I'll put headphones in. Um, you know, I don't, don't like doing that either, mainly because I don't like training in headphones. Um, but sometimes I just got to, to zone out of it too. Yeah. They ignore mine when I put my headphones in. <laughs> They'll still talk to me dramatically pulling it out of my ear. Like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, part of it with the headphones is like when I put the headphones in, it's just like, uh, just kind of separates myself from the gym. Yeah. 
So like my, my brain shuts off from things I need to do in the gym because that's my biggest problem. It's not so much the people talking to me and my members will tell you this shit. I'll be in the middle of doing a workout and I'll work out on a machine and it'll make a creaking noise and I got to fix that shit right now. Like, because <laughs> you like tools. See, I don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, if, if there's something broken and I'm trying to use it, I'm going to fix it in the middle of my I'm workout. Trying- Cause you don't high water, so refurbishes trucks and shit. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I I like doing that, but it's it's definitely uh, uh, ADHD need to not do that in the middle of my workout thing. But the headphones block out the creaking, so you don't hear it. That's, right, that's just focus. No, yeah, it does that, but it also just helps me. Like, I don't know, it it makes me think about the gym as like a place to train more than like a place where I work. So. All right. So that's pretty cool. So how are we progressing the sport forward, in your opinion, as a meet director, as an athlete, and as a coach? How do you see the sport progressing forward uh, through all the controversy that's recently happened? Mm. And where would you like to see it go? Um, um, yeah, that's a, that's a lot to unpack here, because obviously a lot of things have happened uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, you know, I think that with a lot of this stuff, uh, accountability just has to go into place, you know, like, a lot of the uh, roots of where the sport came from, um, which, you know, a lot of people just don't understand that. Uh, You know, a lot of people, a lot of these new people haven't been around for 10 years and I'm not making an excuse for this type of behavior, but I mean, back in the day, powerlifting was an old boys club. Uh, That's that's literally, that's it. Uh, When I started powerlifting, there was one to two other women in the gym, period. When you would go to a meet, there would be, five women at the meet max uh you know i've hosted meets now where there's more women than men uh which i never thought i would see the day and i I love it but uh you know it's it the environment has changed so much um and there has been a lot of a lot of turnover you know like you were saying like there's a lot of new lifters there's a lot of lifters that we came up with that just aren't around anymore uh that's kind of like fell off the face of the earth uh so it's like it's a whole new it's a whole new ball game um, but last time I looked at Rum Seven, where you and I were at, and uh, Kyle set his record there, uh, I think there's only like five or six people who are still active from that two day roster of 126 lifters, yeah. something like that. Which at that point, the pinnacle of raw. Yeah, no, I think that that me, uh, you know, Rum Seven, Rum Eight time frame, that for me, that was like the highlight of powerlifting in my career. Um, though that's not when I was my strongest. Uh, that was when I would go to a meet and you would see Dan Green, you know, break the world record total. Uh, and, and alongside that, you'd see five other world record totals being broken. I mean, it's happening again today. Uh, but it was just that introduction uh, of, of reaching sort of that level uh, of competition and then like having that stage uh, be there. It was, uh, it's crazy. But yeah, there's, there's literally nobody from that time frame that's still around. Um, and I'm pretty bad about keeping up with like, who the new guys are that are, uh, you know, out there breaking world records. Um, you know, I see it, but it, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not on top of the sport. Um, um, but, athletes, that's who you're going to pay attention to at this right. point. You're paying attention to athletes, paying attention to people in your gym. And I'm the same, like, I don't follow uh, as close to those pages that show like the up and coming stars and this and that. Like, I don't need to know them. I don't need to watch. Right. When you've seen Dan, yeah. you've seen, you know, uh, uh, Milenichev and you've seen Belkin, like, doesn't impress you anymore you're just like okay how can we help the next generation and educate yeah. them? i mean to be fair though this this new generation of lifter you know with with the uh growth of power lifting there are so many 18 year old kids now that squat 600 700 pounds scary that that <laughs> even makes me like i'm not even impressed by that anymore which is which is insane because that nobody was doing that 10 years ago no like zero there, people were doing it who deadlifted like 800 at a Texas high school meet. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's insane. Like, nobody was even near that level, uh, uh, you know, like 10 years ago. Like, it's, it's, it's pretty wild to look back at. Uh, I was like number three in 181 at one point, and it was like me. Uh, wasn't Jamie Lewis. What was the other dude's name? Um. I'll have to come back to that one. He had the world, he had the 181 world record for a bit, and then, uh, yeah, then it was John Hack, yeah. uh, and that was 
when John Hack was coming onto the scene too. I think he started probably shortly after I did. His yeah. first major meet was actually with us at Rum Seven. It was it was uh, John Hack, Jamie Lewis, myself. I'm trying to remember who else was in the 81s at that category in time. Um, I don't recall who. I know exactly. Uh, Exactly what the guy looks like, but I'm just and totally then, on it. Who knows, 165 or 181? I think he did both. I don't remember, but he had a squat record for a while. The ultra wide, you know, Bulgarian style training program with uh, him in his garage like twice a day it was kind of wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, crazy dude. <laughs> <laughs> he was like a steel iron worker, so he'd squat at like six in the morning, do like eight hours of manual labor, and come back and squat again at six at night. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no idea how guys do that every day. That's pure yeah. madness. Pretty crazy, but it shows you like the information that's changed out there. Like, you know, when you were in the sport in those days, almost all the information out there was conjugate system or multiply mechanics, geared mechanics. There wasn't people teaching raw mechanics because raw mechanics didn't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, all through the sport, which is what allows us to see those 18, 19 year old kids that are freaks now because we've understood raw mechanics so much more differently. Yeah. Back then it was all about training your posterior chain, and now everyone understands it's about training your anterior chain, you know, just having a stiff enough support system in your spine to carry the load. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I remember looking back at, you know, people coming up in the sport uh, and like a lot of people would, would look at uh, uh, Dan Green and be like, hey, should I squat like Dan Green? Oh my God. <laughs> I like, thought they should squat. I mean, I, if you have the build, you know, eyes down, head down. Right. But, but yeah, that's, that's like, it's like, that was the evolution of like, hey, what does raw lifting look like? Like, what should raw mechanics look like? We're like, Nobody knows. People are just doing this, and these guys are good at it. So take a little bit from here, take a little bit from there. Um, but yeah, that was that was definitely a time frame where like people were experimenting and like trying to figure out like how does this work. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty good. I, I like that. So how many meets do you throw a year in Iowa or around the? Um, so right now uh, we'll probably do five meets this year. Uh, I like to host like four to six. Uh, and they're mainly in Iowa. You know, I'll go up to Minnesota and help Doug up there. I'll, I'll go out to Illinois and help Sergio. Uh, I'll go down to Kansas City and help JP with his meets. Um, but as far as meets that I host here, uh, most of them are in the Des Moines area. I host one meet a year up in Ames. Uh, this year, and I haven't really told anybody this, but we're going to be hosting a meet in Marshalltown. Uh, so we're, we're branching out a little bit. I mean, Iowa's kind of a weird state because there's not too many, like, big i mean des moines is really the big metropolitan area uh so to host meets in like different areas is kind of uh challenging you know you got to find areas where people travel um and or and or areas that have people that are up and coming in the sport and, and you know they have groups of people that want to come do the meet um so i mean the goal would be to do to host six meets a year uh all around the state uh, and that's probably what we're going to do you know moving forward depending on um you know, how, how all the meets go this year, switching over the WRPF. Obviously, there's a lot of unknown. So, um, you know, I'm learning as I go, uh, as everybody else is, uh, that has that has made the jump uh, to the new federation. So You touched on, you know, the turnover, not having beginners in the chair and as officials, and they have set some interesting ground rules where people have to do at least three full power meets unless it's, you know, special special position, like somebody who can only do bench only for medical reasons and stuff like that. And they make them sit for the written test. They have to have a score of 90, not 70. And they have to do a certain amount of flights as a practical, which I think is two days worth, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's all in the Discord, so it's hard to keep track of sometimes. But they really <laughs> work on legitimizing the rule system within that federation and making sure the, the quality and the standards are so much higher than they were in other, other areas and other federations where they really let down. Because you can have someone who did no meets, take the test, sit for practical, and sit in a chair. And they're like, they've never competed. They didn't care. It wasn't yeah. So definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there are federations out there that have, you don't even have to do a practical test. Mm -hmm. Um, which to me is, is absolutely insane. Um, you know, how, how can you judge a sport that like, you know, you, that's like, Hey, here, read the rule book. All right. It's like going to do a job and you, you read the employee handbook and then nobody tells you how to do your job. <laughs> nobody shows you how to do it. You know, like it's, it, it's pretty wild to me. Um, so yeah, I, I like seeing, uh, the improvement of, of you know, learning from, uh, all the other federations and learning from just the sport in general, um, you know, because uh, officials should have that experience uh, in the chair. They should be able to 
have done a certain amount of powerlifting meets, um, should hopefully still be active in powerlifting. And I think that was one, one rule that was uh, kind of weird in one federation, but it's, you know, you have to do a meet a year. Um, and, you know, like obviously some of these older guys uh, aren't competing as, as frequently as, as some of these younger guys. Um, so uh, it's, it's good to see it, it advancing and, and improving because I think that that's, that was why I brought, um, you know, the USPA to Iowa initially was because there was nothing like that. You know, there was, there was no standard as far as uh, referee certification in any federations really. So um, seeing that being improved upon, uh, you know, makes me pretty hopeful for, for the future. What do you like to keep uh, up to date on like current research, current trends, current data revolving around strength training? Um, no, I, I don't really keep up on all the current stuff as much. I, <laughs> I, I just go back and I reread all the books I already have. Um, you know, obviously there, there are new things coming sure. out that are important. Um, and some of the research coming out is, is, is quality. Um, you know, obviously I'll get sent like PubMed articles about things. Um, you know, obviously you read that stuff, you take it with a grain of salt, you, you know, you decide like, Hey, does this actually affect training in general? Um, but a lot of the stuff out there is, is not super useful because most people don't focus on the basics. So, um, you know, obviously getting on social media, uh, seeing a lot of the information coming through there. Uh, as far as like how certain people are training, you know, watching how people train, watching how people lift, uh, continually just being aware of that sort of stuff too, because I think that's, that's one thing where people sort of get away from uh, trying to learn from other people all the time. You know, they see it or they want to point out what that person's doing wrong instead of like trying to understand it. Um, so yeah, I just go back and I reread uh, and, and continually buy uh, older uh, strength training books and, and then you, know. you say that because there's like a meta-analysis of strength studies recently and like a uh, data different strength like talked about their block structure that they've recently learned with all their athletes it was like a one week intro phase three to four weeks of structural work followed by down down week which would be a deload and i'm like you mean the shit they were doing in the 70s <laughs> right well i mean like if, if you look at all the the personal training certifications yeah. of today all of the stuff is structured based off of well, all of the old school structure, like it's, it's the, yeah, right, training is literally like the Bible still. I mean, people don't even know the book exists, but that's literally what all the periodization programs are and, and uh, problem chart are, are written off of and formulated around. They just use different verbiage instead of percentage structures. They're using RPE, but it's the same loading parameters. It's the same cycles. It's the same time lane, time load. You know, it's like, this has literally been done since the seventies effectively. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I think that the, there's a lot of people that, that see new research, uh, that see the new hot trends uh, and get distracted by it. You know, like that's, that's obviously we live in the world of social media now. Um, and it's a tool, it's all about how you use it. But, you know, I think people, uh, they see it and they go, ooh, shiny new thing. Yes. You know, shiny new movement. Uh, oh, this is shown, this thing is shown to do X, Y, Z. Uh, this study shows it. Um, cool, but like, what's the, you know, the application of it? Like, and, and why are you doing it? You know? right. Give me an intent before you ask for it. Absolutely. All right. Really, really important question. How jealous should everybody in every other state be that they don't have a Fong's pizza? A what? Fong? Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, Fong's is pretty amazing. Uh, not gonna lie. It's it is the pizza spot. Uh, you know, now I'm going to go get Fong's this weekend because I haven't been thinking about it for a little bit, but you might. Uh, I've been doing a uh, zombie burger lately too. Oh yeah. Did you get to go to zombie burger? It's bad. It's bad. The ambiance is pretty damn cool though with the zombies everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean the gym's in the East village. So you got all this like downtown food. Uh, it's just, it, it's great. But yeah, Fong's crab rangoon pizza. Um, yeah, it's, it, I, you can't top it. Like, it's weird, but it's delicious. It is. It's amazing. And the, the fried mozzarella sticks, which are like egg rolls. Mm -hmm. I forgot about getting those. Yeah, those are good, too. Yeah, I can't forget about that, because I, I only get it if I visit Iowa. <laughs> yeah. And then they have, like, uh, the same thing, but, like, it's like a raspberry. Did you get the dessert thing? 
No, not yet. Okay, so, so that's the next berry egg roll or something. I don't know. It's it's weird, but I've heard it's really good. So that's gonna be the next trip to Iowa. I'm gonna get the raspberry egg <laughs> bongs pizza. All right. So I like to ask this question. Doesn't have to be strength related. A book that you would recommend that most people read. Oh, I hate this. I know. <laughs> the pick one book thing. I can't do it. <laughs> oh man. This is one I should have been prepared for here. Let me look at my bookshelf. I know we're we're four episodes deep. I've asked the same question every time. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> should have been ready. Um, any, any book that has impacted you in a way that you feel would impact other people? Man. So like, and this is just like just business in general. Um, but there's a book, Maximum Achievement, by Brian Tracy. Yeah. Uh, I've been a pretty big Brian Tracy fan for like since I got into sales uh, in the gym industry many many years ago but uh, you know a lot of it's uh, mindset focused uh, you know which I think is a, is a big missing aspect of, of people trying to you know succeed in life uh, his, his, his stuff is broke down to be very very simple um, very straightforward and you know I think it's it's a book that when you read it you're like okay this makes Makes sense. Uh, whereas a lot of these books, of a lot of his books, are more more digestible because you hear the passion and the persuasion in which he speaks them. Like his book, The Psychology of Success, and mm -hmm. so forth. Because he has he has a stage presence that's polarizing. Yeah, that's the other thing too. I mean, I had a lot of his audiobooks, <laughs> and once you listen to one of his audiobooks, you hear his voice when you read his yeah. his, his regular books. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it just it just resonates, and it's. Uh, it's motivating. Yeah, his, his, his voice is just one of those where, like, you hear it and you're like, okay, motivated instantly. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, a, that's a great selection because it is, you know, personal development, and we're all doing this to try and get better at something, not just powerlifting, but life. But personal development is a huge thing. So Maximum Achievement was the book you'd recommend. All right, cool. People who want to contact you for coaching or want to find out more information at the gym and want to find out more information about the apparel – which his apparel is very similar to like tattoo culture stuff. There's a lot of cool designs and dragons and shit. Both Jake and I have dragons and we both are missing an adductor. We're basically twins. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously Hartman strength for the Instagram. Uh, that's what I use for most everything uh, on the training side and programming side. Uh, the gym is DSM barbell on Instagram and that's DSM barbell.com for all the apparel. Obviously if you go to the DSM barbell, uh, page you can get on the link tree and see all the stuff that we have to offer there too um, as far as membership and training and all that so yep well you guys can contact jake make sure you're following jake uh he's been a friend of mine for a very long time and i will shamefully admit this if i was ranked eighth he was ranked six if i was ranked five he was ranked three he's just a pain in my ass <laughs> so that's okay. those are the friends you need in life <laughs> those are the ones you do. yeah that's the carrot i'm chasing yeah. so uh hello I did hit 1,800 total raw first before he did. So this is true. This is true. This is true. Uh, and I'm officially a sub master now, by the way. Oh. So give, like, me like, give me like five more years to get stronger. <laughs> That's all it took me was like five more years to get stronger. I'll never catch the depth. Though. There's no way. There's no way. So. I'm still trying to catch my depth. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> well, I love that you were able to join me and have fun tonight i appreciate that time thank you so much and i'll be posting this on youtube i'll send you the link once it's uploaded it takes like an hour but once it's uploaded i'll send you the link so you can share the youtube as well so anyone who couldn't hang out here could just watch it the leaves are on youtube and it's always on my page so thank you jake appreciate it awesome brother thank you have a good night man you too.